hello everyone. Today we are talking three Edinburgh eerie tales. As Merlin joins us, as his magic ability is, as soon as the camera starts rolling, he seems to know uh, what I'm doing. Hello, how are you all? Hope you're all happy and healthy and safe out there. Uh, today's video is actually subscriber suggested. I asked on Instagram a week or so ago what sort of videos you guys would like since we are locked in and I can't go out and explore Edinburgh and someone suggested spooky, eerie Edinburgh stories. So that's exactly what we're doing today. Three Edinburgh eerie stories. However, my kitchen is probably not exactly the right kind of feel. So I think we need a change of atmosphere. Our first story is the tale of the burning Cannon Gate girl. We start in the 18th century. There was a daughter who was a young girl of a distinguished family in the Cannon Gate. The family discovered that the girl was pregnant out of wedlock. And what made this worse was that the father was a lowly servant lad. The father decided that something had to be done straight away and the girl was forbidden to leave the house from that moment onwards. The father was afraid of the shame that this might bring upon the family. A little while later, the father called a minister to the house to perform the last rites for the daughter. The minister arriving at the house to perform the last rites found this odd. The daughter didn't seem ill. He asked the father what was wrong with the daughter since the daughter seemed in good health. The father told him that the daughter was suffering from an incurable disease and would be dead within the next few days. After the minister started to perform the last rites on the daughter, he started to hear a baby crying in the nearby room. The minister, knowing the family for some time, was unaware of a baby being born to this family. So the father feared that the minister was starting to grow suspicious. He started to hurry the minister on to finish the prayer. Once the minister had finished giving the last rites, the family immediately started to usher him out of the house. They got him outside the front door. The father shook his hand, giving him a wad of money at the time, and then shut the door in his face. The next day, the minister heard that a house was on fire down in the Canning Gate. He immediately headed down there to see if he could aid in any way. He was in shock when he found out that it was actually the house he'd been at the previous day. He was even more shocked when he found out that the house hadn't just caught fire, but a young girl was trapped inside and had sadly lost her life. His suspicions were immediately aroused, however he was scared if he said anything of any repercussions that could happen to him. He didn't say a word. Years later, when the minister was close to death, he shared the story. And he shared his suspicions that it had actually been arson, that the house had been deliberately set on fire, and that the poor girl inside had been murdered. Years went by and the house had been rebuilt. Families came and went, but in the second half of the 18th century, the house caught fire again. Witnesses said that an apparition of a young girl appeared in the window. She was heard to be screaming, burned once, burned twice. The third time, I'll scare you all. The girl has never been seen since. Our second story is the tale of Sir Richard Lawson. In the heart of the Royal Mile lies the Mercat Cross. This is a tall structure which used to be the centre of many activities, most often royal proclamations or news of the day. In 1513, Sir Richard Lawson lived in the building opposite overlooking the Market Cross. He was standing at his window taking in the city when he saw a hooded figure standing on the Market Cross. He swears it was Old Clutie himself. Old Clutie is a Scottish name for the devil. From his robes, the figure pulled out a scroll. The scroll on it had a list of names. A list of names that he declared were soon to die. Richard Lawson couldn't move. He was frozen to the spot in terror. The figure started to read the names. The first was that of King James IV. After this, the names seemed to descend in rank. Dukes, Earls, Viscounts, Lords, Knights and Gentlemen. Lawson, still frozen to the spot, listened as the hooded figure read name after name. Then. He heard the name, Richard Lawson, merchant. He fell to his knees, praying, begging. He reached into his purse, pulled
pulled out a coin and tossed it to the hooded figure, begging for his name to be taken off the list. Aunt Clutty, being a true Scotsman, picked up the coin and vanished. A few months later, Lawson was called up to fight for the king. Lawson, knowing what he had heard, unsure if this was to be the day he died or not, did his duty and went into battle for the king. On Florin Field, many Scottish noblemen died, including the king. Lawson survived. His prayers had either been heard or old Clutie was just grateful for the coin. Either way, Lawson survived. This is either a tale of incredible bravery from Lawson, knowing that his name was on the list of people to die, yet still heading to the battlefield, or it's a lesson for us all. Next time you're heading down the Royal Mile and you pass the Market Cross, just make sure you've got a coin in your pocket. Our last tale is the tale of Major Thomas Weir. Major Thomas Weir was a well-respected and well-known member of the community in Edinburgh. He lived on West Bow Street, the street that used to attach the grass market to the Royal Mile. Known to be a religious man, a strict member of the Presbyterian Church, he seemed to live a particularly pious life. He even held frequent prayer meetings in his own house, apparently leading the prayer meetings more like a preacher than anything else. He truly was considered a pillar of the community. However, one day, when he himself was attending a religious ceremony, stood up and proclaimed that he had been in service of Beelzebub, the devil himself. He was a servant of Lucifer. Something must be wrong. Major Weir himself would never, ever have been involved with anything like this. Some people had always called him near angelic. So how could he be proclaiming that he was a servant of the devil? Members of the church tried to reason with him, begged with him, talked to him, but he was adamant in his proclamation. He was so adamant that they called in some medical services to check him over. The doctors declared him to be mentally disturbed. Authorities, however, were very reluctant to prosecute him. This was major weir. How could they possibly bring charges against him? However, he remained absolutely resolute in what he had said. Not only that, but he wanted no pardon for what he had done. So he was imprisoned in the city toll booth in the heart of the Royal Mile, while further investigation was looked into. He had also implicated his sister Giselle in his crimes. So obviously, the authorities had to speak to her, hoping that there would be some sort of resolution and understanding that he was purely ill in the head and none of this could possibly be true. However, Giselle corroborated every single word that her brother had said. Not only that, but she declared that the two of them had been in an incestuous relationship. She declared that a black staff that Major Weir carried about with him had been a gift from the devil himself, and that it wielded unspeakable powers. Giselle, who was once known as the quiet spinster sister, with all of her confessions, was now known as Giselle the Necromancer. Next, she proudly showed off the mark of a horseshoe in her forehead, which appeared when she frowned. She claimed that it was given to her by the devil himself. She also said that all that had been passed down to her and her brother had been learnt from their mother. She herself had also been a witch. The two started to tell tales of how Major Weir often took the devil's black stagecoach to Dalkeith, a fiery stagecoach that would ride through the town at night time. The authorities had absolutely no alternative but to take the two of them to trial. However, even though they should have been charged with witchcraft in a face-saving exercise for the church, after all, Major Weir had been such a pillar for the church, they charged them with unnatural sexual practices. The two of them remained absolute in their convictions. Declaring their guilt from the start, there was only one possible verdict. Guilty. Both of them were sentenced to death. The Major was to be burned at the stake, and as he was tied to the pillar, the rope tightening around his neck, he refused to pray to God for mercy. 
his black staff was tossed into the flames beside him, and the two of them took an unnatural amount of time to burn. Witnesses claimed that the black staff, as it burned, twisted and jumped. Grizel's hanging was no less dramatic. As she was being led to the gallows, she tried and tried to rip her clothes off in a last act against decency to show her nakedness to the crowds that had assembled. After the initial shock had died down and the two of them had been executed, more stories started to arise about them. People started to say that the house always seemed to have odd goings on about it. There was lights and noises coming from it at odd hours, and once the figure of a woman twice the height of a normal woman standing in the doorway. She appeared to be laughing maniacally outside. The major staff that had been burned with him was said to have been able to run errands on its own for its master's bidding. So much so was the reputation the two of them left behind that the house long since gone now lay vacant for many years as people refused to enter claiming that it was haunted. Major Weir's reputation as a warlock has continued to grow. Hope you enjoyed that today guys. Thank you for the suggestion. If you did, please remember to give it a like, subscribe, leave a comment, but stay safe out there. Until next time, bye humans.